see this. And uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is our penultimate uh, second last uh, ep episode or, or uh, session of Meet the New Critics. And today we are with Michelle Beaton. Uh, Michelle uh, has previously served for the last couple of years as our critic for agriculture and land, as well as our finance critic. And uh, so she, those, are, those are very big files in their own right. And now she's traded those in for, for health and wellness, which, which might even still be bigger than those, <laughs> all those other ones combined, who knows? She'll, she'll find out. Um, and before we get into our conversation, I just want to acknowledge that the land that uh, we're gathered on today is the unceded uh, traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, so it's good to acknowledge that even when we're assembled virtually, we're probably, probably all on PEI. There's any, we, we have had some people actually join us from other parts of Canada that just found out about these events at, at some of the last ones. So uh, you never know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm just gonna start off uh, with a few questions uh, for Michelle, just to get us going. And then we're going to open it up to, uh, to all of you to, uh, to bring up the things that maybe uh, brought you here today that uh, you're interested in for, uh, for health and wellness. So my first question to you, Michelle, is, uh, you know, we've, we've known you in your role as uh, agriculture and land and, and finance critic. And, uh, and you, you know, you've, you've really made a, a name for yourself, I think, in those, in those files, uh, you know, just through your, the way in which you've, you've uh, dealt with, with the government, uh, you know, your sort of direct and, and very cutting sort of, <laughs> sort of way. Um, and I'm just wondering what, what, if you can tell us a little bit about what you learned from that uh, experience over the last couple of years, um, you know, about those files and even about, you know, what it is to be a critic um, mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, I can honestly say when I first became the critic, I, I felt awkward about it. I felt, um, you know, I felt it had a very negative connotation with it. And somebody had said to me, well, imagine, a movie critic. They can like things and they can dislike things. But as long as you are reporting on, you know, and speaking to it of how you truly feel about it, um, it can be a good thing or a bad thing. And it all depends on how they uh, perform. And mm -hmm. so I think that's, um, I, 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 find, I feel like I can be a very understanding person for probably a short period of time. <laughs> and uh, I could give the benefit of the doubt, but when I don't see action, and I think that comes from my history of working in, um, in product management and doing a lot of project management within that, within that, uh, that profession, that if you're not moving forward constantly, then you're not going to achieve anything. So I don't you're like going backwards. <laughs> you're going backwards. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I, I, when the land issue, the land issue kind of fell, um, that sale in, in, uh, in Bedeck kind of fell right after we were elected. And um, that really just, I, it gave me comfort because you know, when you're on the right side of things, it's easy to fight and to fight hard. And I've been described a number of times as a dog with a bone because I keep on going. And I've heard that three times this for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's funny cause they always said it to me when I was in high school or when I was in university as well, or in the last, so in my last uh, um, companies that I worked with. So I'm glad I can take that into this position and kind of shed any kind of um, inhibitions and just go after it because we have a very short period of time where you, you're not uh, you're not guaranteed to, be guaranteed to be elected for a long time, so you better do the work now. Yeah, very brave of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I mean that. Thank you. So, so, uh, so during your time, you know, in in those other critic portfolios, um, was there anything that you found uh, particularly uh, rewarding that, like, that you feel like you were able to move forward? Um, in those files? And, and conversely, was there anything that you found really frustrating, like maybe harder to affect change in than you thought might be possible? Yeah, I can tell you one quick 
it was a quick hit and it actually happened very fast, but we, we learned about um, uh, payday loans and that we were the highest interest rates across Canada and obscene mm -hmm. interest rates, completely really? taking people, um, vulnerable people, um, taking them um, at the worst financially insecure time that you could possibly um, basically take them, take them, what's my word I'm looking for, but you know what I mean? Taking them, um, take advantage of them. Advantage of them, yeah. Yeah, and so that was actually a regulation change. So that was that was a rewarding one for me because I didn't have to wait for legislation to go through. I didn't have to wait for consultation. It was just a fast change and it happened within two months. And we found a problem, we had heard about it, we brought it forward and government, government made the change and that is rewarding when you see that happen. So I might have been spoiled that that was one of the first action things that we brought forward um, because then I've recognized that when you're not ready to make a decision, that there are ways for you to delay decision making processes, such as putting committees in place or saying we're going to do a report on that or we're going to do an investigation or we have to do consultation mm -hmm. and all of that's add so much to, onto your timeline of getting something accomplished and then next thing you know you are two years in you've been promised four times that you're going to have land um land um legislation come forward and it's still not here and that mm. those are the that's the frustrating time but when you can actually really impact somebody's somebody's life because they've shared a story with you and you can dig in to see where the problem is and remove that barrier and that's what our job is like that's I've realized now that is what my job is and if I'm not willing to put that work in and actually start improving lives of islanders I'm not here doing the right work that I'm supposed to be doing yeah that's great awesome and yes yeah. awesome commitment thank you so Michelle um now that you're you're in health and wellness I guess my my first question is uh why, why do you think uh, you got pegged for, for this particular portfolio? Well, I think that there was a number of reasons for it. I mean, it is the, um, you serve it at the will of, the, of your leader. So um, I am proud that Peter asked me to do this role because it is a big portfolio. Um, what we did find in the, especially in the last two sittings, so I represent Str Mermaid Stratford, and there's a lot of healthcare providers and healthcare workers that live in Stratford. So mm -hmm. I actually found that I had a lot of people calling me that worked within the system and identifying issues. And so I was bringing a lot of health issues to the floor of the legislature anyway, whether it be from constituent constituents dealing with issues, mm -hmm. but I also seem to have a lot of healthcare providers that were also reaching out to me. So that that's a bonus, right? And so I think that um, once we kind of look back and, and thought, well, I'm talking about health a lot anyway. I'm also really process driven. As a product manager, you identify where things are wrong or how to launch or what you want a service to look like. And then you build it to, to um, well, you, find, you figure out you have a problem, first of all, you know, you don't, you don't, have a project without having a problem that you're trying to solve. So mm -hmm. once you identify that, then you work very systematically through a process in order to be able to bring something um, forward, whether it be a product or a service and put it for me as a product manager, I would have put it into the marketplace. But, you know, we have to look at Islanders as being the the clients, the customers that we're serving and government should be serving yes. Islanders. And so I think that that was also something that was considered um, when we kind of looked at skill sets. And I think that there's a lot of process issues within, um, the, within this portfolio that if we can continue to um, fix processes here and there, uh, we'll start to see some, uh, some improvements. And it's, it can even happen with small changes, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's where you have to start. So there's no one silver bullet that's going to fix everything, but you have to identify all those things that can come together in order for you to uh, to put in um, a service that's going to actually meet the needs to people who want to use it. So I think really, Jordan, that probably played, played a part as well, that skill set. 
Yeah, it seems like a good good skill set to have if you're going to be taking on a, a complex uh, portfolio like that. <laughs> yeah, so, definitely, um, and be able to hang on to that bone when you're got when you're <laughs> got the gnawing on it. That's that's huge too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you need to be a dog with a bone. So, um, so now I'm wondering if you can give us just a quick sense of, of what the scope is of health and wellness. Uh, you know, what kinds of things do you cover? I mean, some of them will be, you know, pretty obvious, but you can just go through some of the different components of the health system that you're going to be looking at. Sure. So it's anything that falls under the scope of the Department of Health and Wellness. So um, anything under health PEI. So it would be any of our um, care facilities. It includes long-term care facilities, um, community care. It includes the hospitals, the, um, the clinics, um, any of the allied health workers. Um, it also, interestingly enough, um, would include any of the um, associations around sports. So um, Special Olympics, uh, softball, rugby, all of those sports would be encompassed underneath that as well. It also has to do with wellness. So any of the programming that you would see um, like Go PEI and Cycling PEI and all those kinds of things all kind of come in underneath it. So it's it's a vast portfolio really. Yeah. And um it actually even ties in. So when you look at, at health issues, often we're going to talk about the social determinants of health. And we also know that that threads through, weaves itself through so many other portfolios. And so um, you will see, I think a lot of our caucus talking about a lot of different health issues because all of our constituents are impacted by it. Um, and there's such a broad array of of services underneath it. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And when I when I list out the things, it doesn't sound very big. But when you that when you nice. yeah when you <laughs> kind of look underneath that umbrella, there is a lot of components underneath it. Yeah, and you know that idea about uh, you know the interconnections between different departments and like that's come up in in pretty much all of our conversations we've been having with the MLAs here. You know, there's got to be a lot more of that cross connection. Um, so, uh, so now I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what parts of, of your portfolio you feel like you have the most learning to do in. you know, what do you need? Are you going to need the most help with to get up to speed on? Um, so I recognize that I need a lot of help understanding how all of the different components interact. Um, with each other. There's some really big governance pieces to this. So there is the department, but there's also the health PEI board, and then there's health PEI itself. So mm -hmm. there's there's quite a bit of governance structure in there that um, needs a lot of work, I won't lie. And then there's also how all of the different systems within our primary acute care, emergency care, all that, how that all interacts with each other. Um, and so we've spent time meeting with Health PEI, the department, the unions, and um, we still have more unions to go, looking at like the medical society and all of those, um, all of the different associations that represent the providers underneath that underneath that umbrella. And you know, like different things like scope of practice. Scope of practice is huge. And like we've met with the, the, the Association of Pharmacists and we recognize like there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of things that different um, healthcare providers are trained to do, but they're not allowed to practice here in PEI, but they do practice that, those in other jurisdictions. So that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in. And I don't feel like we have a whole lot of data that we can make sound decisions by, whether that data comes out of health PEI or, um, whether it comes out of, you know, we saw an article ye this yesterday, I believe it came out, saying that the department didn't know the usage of walk-in clinics, but that's pretty important information to have. Mm -hmm. Where are people getting their, where are they getting their services and, you know, what services they need? And you have to have access to data in order to make sound decisions. Um, but it's private, that data, right? 
Can well, we get that data? Like I read a little bit about it and it was saying that it's technically a private business, so they don't have to give you any data. Mm, actually, in the legislation, the the it's it shows the powers of the minister has the ability to set benchmarks and to be able to provide the information to see to show that they're that they are achieving those goals that have been set out, which they would have to do that through analytics. And it's not private and like it's not like I'm asking what your name is and what your condition is. Like it could be, you know. Yeah, that's not the kind of privacy I meant. I meant the, yeah. the, it's the privacy of the corporate business, the pharmacy, and and that um, and if the minister can uh, make them accountable, then then under under what under what in what information you know, like how, how how is it operating? Who's benefiting? What is it based on? What's the service ratio? Stuff like that. I kind of didn't feel like. Uh, it was very open information, I guess, is what I'm saying. If you can get it, that's wonderful. I, I just didn't know. I, what I read was that they were private and it was just yeah. hard to get the information. And what's important is, is when you have the power to ask for the information that you that you do actually clearly define the information that you require in order yeah. to make those decisions. Because yeah. uh, the really the ultimate power does reside with the minister. At the end are of the they day. set up as private corporations uh, it's a crown contracted corporate. by the government? It's a crown corporation. It's that infamous well, word, which I never understood. <laughs> yeah, health PEI would be a crown corporation. Mm -hmm. So who owns that? Questions under there, Suzanne, to be yeah. asked. Yeah. But again, it's one of those things that once you define, once you encounter a barrier, you work towards how do you remove that barrier? Because without having- There's that doggedness, I love it. <laughs> right? <laughs> without having the information of what yeah, services are needed decision. and the one, what's not, you know, what's not yeah. available, then we have to start filling gaps, but we, we can't fill the gaps unless we know what's the, what's missing. What's, yeah. 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 So Michelle, yeah. Um, so now I know that, uh, you know, you're, you're new to the portfolio, uh, quite new, but you, I've, I've seen you already publish a few, uh, blogs and and uh you know put out some statements and and you were just telling us about the work that you want to do on the scope of practice and and getting better data is there anything else that you'd like to share with us right now that um that you are are thinking you'd like to uh do some more work on or that you've already started to do some work on yeah i think we have a really good opportunity to look at um a gen the gender diverse um, health strategy. So a, a women's health strategy or women that identify or people that identify as women, there are huge gaps within the system there. And, um, you know, when you have the first opposition that is majority women, obviously that is something that, you know, is important to us. And we have a lot, we've had a lot of um, people come to us with really devastating, unbelievable stories of care that is received within the healthcare system. And by and large, because um, those that have been making decisions don't understand what the actual health, is, what the health concern is. is. And um, so that's another aspect. And the department will actually be coming to, to on the 29th of J July to deliver their um, women women's health strategy to us so that's, that's definitely something else that we're okay. interested in in really making inroads for okay that's that's great um, thanks for for that Michelle and uh, now obviously we've invited you all here because we want to hear from you so we're gonna we're gonna spend the rest of our hour doing just that now um, what I, I'd like to invite you to do is uh, you can use the raise hand function on Zoom uh, to, to get on the, the speakers list. Uh, you'll find that raise hand function under reactions in your Zoom toolbar, typically, depending on the device that you're on. You might, uh, depending on your device, you might have to go to the dot, 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 more button and, and find it there. Um, but if you can't find that, don't worry about it. You can just, uh, Type a, an asterisk in the chat, or if you if you aren't able to uh, to speak, and I know there's at least one person here who's uh, having some audio issues coming this way, um, feel free to 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 put your points um, in the chat. And I'm also going to share with you a link right now 
to a board that I've set up and I'm going to be taking notes as people bring up their, their ideas and suggestions um, and issues so that we don't lose any of this. Um, but you can also feel free to add things to this board on your own. If, uh, you know, maybe it's just something that, uh, you know, we've got a lot of people speaking and you're not able to get to it, or you just prefer to add it to the board, please do that. And, you know, in a few days, because we're going to give people, we're going to send everybody who's registered for, for this access to that board to add their points as well. And then I'm going to hand over the package to Michelle. Uh, so the link to that is in the board right now. Um, and what we're looking for is, you know, like I said, uh, maybe at, at the top and maybe not everybody was here at the time is this isn't so much a question and answer because, you know, Michelle is just getting into this, this role and she definitely, uh, she'll admit she doesn't have all the answers, but we are looking for, you know, what you see as issues that she should be aware of, issues that you would like to see her working on as a priority and suggestions for, um, you know, ideas or resources that you think she should be having a look at uh, to get up to speed and, and bring some cool stuff to the legislature. So I've got Jennifer's hand up. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you go ahead and get us started off? Hi, thanks so much. So, um, I've been personally impacted by the doctor shortage that we have here, my, my whole family has. Um, and just something that I kind of thought maybe you should be aware of and, and maybe you could look into. Um, we have a doctor in our Summerside clinic um, that's been backfilling for a doctor that left. Um, and now she's advised us that she's leaving in August um, and she's willing to stay, but Health PEI has decided not to renew her contract. So with 19,000 people almost on the um, wait list for a doctor, that just kind of seems um, crazy to me that that's, that that's happening. So just kind of wanted to make you aware of that. And I, it makes me wonder um, why we don't hear always about why doctors are leaving or are their contracts actually not being renewed or are they leaving voluntarily or are they not happy with the way things are being run? It's just... It, it seems like there's something bigger going on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you for that, Jennifer. And, and we have definitely been hearing that from many people. And I know uh, Trish brought to the legislature um, exit surveys um, and that everybody leaving should have to fill out an exit survey. Um, and Lynn has also highlighted and is working on um, a solution around NDAs because our understanding is, is that there is a non-disclosure agreement that is also required to be signed or I don't know if it's required, but in order to, um, to leave or whatever. So both Lynn and Trish are doing a lot of and have done a lot of work around that, but you're absolutely right. Um, there is a a pattern that is developing in Summerside. Um, you know, like when we look at retiring doctors, 60, I think it's, um, I think they 40%, I think of our doctors are over 60 years old or it's a very high number and close to retiring, but that's not why they're leaving in Summerside. And um, so it is concerning and I appreciate that you joined and that you um, highlighted that because, um, those are that those are some of the things that are really hard to get a clear answer on and uh, but it's not going to be for a lack of trying on our part well that is absolutely something that we will continue to um, try to work through and figure it out okay yeah thanks uh, very much Jennifer for for bringing that up uh, welcome to Martin who just joined us good to see you here and just to, to let you know where we're at right now is we're, we, we're just opening it up for folks uh, that want to bring up an issue that you think that Michelle uh, should be aware of, working on, as well as any, any ideas or resources that you could point her to, um, to uh, bring those ideas into the legislature. So I've got uh, Suzanne's hand is up next. So I'll, let's go over to Suzanne. Um, yes, um, first, um, I wanted to reinforce what Jennifer said, because I had a similar experience 
Uh, my, my husband had a, a triple aortic aneurysm and required uh, vascular surgery over in Halifax during COVID. And um, when he came back, um, uh, he, he, was, he was okay, but we didn't really have, the, the doctor that was taking care of him was from Halifax and coming here, I think they were going bi-weekly and trading off and all of a sudden they just disappeared. They were no longer coming here. I guess their contract wasn't renewed or whatever. So in essence, I was left without a, a specialist to, to consult uh, as far as any questions I might have or any questions he had and follow up et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to say, I, I don't understand why they're disappearing. These were young men, very skilled, and it was very helpful to have them here. And then all of a sudden they were disconnected. So um, that's just to second that. The, the other question um, or issue was, um, are we losing doctors because, because of uh, the way our health, we, we don't have enough in the budget to hire more doctors and nurses? I, I don't understand why we're losing them, I guess. And so I was wondering, are there any reasons why they're not being renewed? Um, so I can honestly say, we did meet with Health PEI and I can honestly say that um, there are privacy things that they've alluded to that they cannot actually speak to um, individual cases and what the situations are surrounding individual cases because of those privacy issues. Well, is it so addressed the, in the exit survey then that they're leaving because they had, you know, insufficient funding to keep them? I mean, well, wouldn't that be I, something handled in the exit survey? And I don't think it's, um, the, I don't think it's the funding because, um, you know, when you have so many shortages, you actually budget for having a full roster, full complement. So it's not that we aren't. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. So it's not like we don't have the money in the budget. Um, I mean, there's a number of things that we need to look at, um, you know, like when it comes to treasury board policies and when it comes to HR issues and that kind of thing. So one thing that D Dr. Gardam did tell us in the standing committee was that ex the exit survey results were by and large standard HR concerns or, or issues. And um, I Does that think mean personality issues when you say human relation issues, what do you mean? Yeah, well, it could be the, it could be the, um, it could be the, uh, you know, like the culture of where where they're working, it could be, you know, maybe not getting along with other individuals within. Um, now, also there is all there is, and I don't have all the answers. Like I'm, it, no, this I is understand. literally that onion, right? So everybody, every time you talk to somebody, you get a little more piece of the of information, which is why this is frustrating. So number one with PEI is when we lose one doctor, that is a huge impact to us. If we were in Ontario and we lost one doctor, we would never ever hear about that in the news, right? right. Um, exactly my point, because yeah. my, my, my friend out in Ontario, you know, she goes to her family doctor and, and, and she can get to him and have an appointment that afternoon. When I call my family doctor, there's a phalanx of defenses set up to keep me away from him. I not only have to, uh, one would think, deal with his receptionist, but I must deal, deal with a call the call-in bank that only allows me to, to call between the hours of nine and 11. And, and that's to get to the appointment person who will then make an appointment with his, his receptionist who will then give me an appointment with him. Seems yeah. quite complicated. And then to compound that, the call-in center for the nine to 11 hours will not take messages. So therefore you are required to keep calling in. I, I recently redialed 50 times in the two hours to try and get through to the call-in staff to make an appointment and was unsuccessful, mind you. And then at that point it was over. Now I was home and having been recently released from the hospital and I needed to talk to my doctor. And this is how complicated and convolute the system has become that not only do I have to get, I have a, 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 a bunch of a call in bank that I have to reach before I can even reach his receptionist before I can even reach him. 
and 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 if I only have two hours to call in and I'm calling back 50 times, how many times are the other people calling back since they will not simply take a message so that you call in once and get on the list to be called back? That would seem quite logical to me, but no, we must continue calling back because they refuse to write down your name and phone number. Again, a, a convolute system specifically designed that way in my opinion. And I feel bad because in my hospital stay, uh, about 15 days ago or whatever, two weeks ago, I couldn't feel more taken care of mm -hmm. by the staff, by the nurses and by the doctors. And they're trying so hard to do their job. And yet it seems like something's making it difficult for them that shouldn't be. I think we have the finest doctors here and I think they get very discouraged and, and, and overburdened with, with this type of system. And I, I, I'm not sure why it exists this way. I really, I'm really quite baffled as to why we make it so complicated when my friend in Toronto calls her doctor and gets an appointment that afternoon. Yeah. And I don't know why it's so hard to hire. It's an HR problem and you have people who have personality clashes or whatever is, is encompassed in an HR issue that makes you leave your job. You go and you go somewhere else. If you're in Kensington, so go over to Summerside or go to, so you know what I'm saying? That's what the normal businesses do. If I have a problem at my job and I don't like the people or I don't, I'm not happy, I feel the environment is hostile or whatever, I pick up and move to another job. I don't, I don't move to the another part of the world. Yeah. You know, I, I don't understand. And I don't understand that exit survey should address that. The exit survey can be anonymous, so it doesn't have to be people t talking out of turn or, or whatever. It should be an anonymous survey and we should be able to see the results of it. And, and I get very frustrated with information that's continually buried under, you know, Oh, it's HR and we can't talk about it. It's this and that. And we don't, we don't reveal that. We don't discuss this. That's issue number one. Now I'll bend your ear about issue number two, if I have time. Yeah. Go is ahead. That okay. uh, do you mind, or, Suzanne, if we, uh, we have a couple people with their hands up, uh, well, do you mind I'll if wait. we go yeah, them and then we can come back to you? Sure. No problem. Okay. And thank you for sharing all that. I think, I think your frustrations are are very, you know, that's, uh, there's a lot of people probably sharing. I feel bad for our doctors. So. I really do. I feel yeah. they're overburdened with this nonsense when all they want to do is medical care. Yeah. John, or Jordan, could you add to the list there? Like, I know we talked about exit surveys, but I think something that's also like that I'm hearing is, is we don't, we don't want to wait until somebody's already at the point of leaving before we actually ask them what issues they have. So it almost like a, um, you know, like a annual staff survey. That's what I used to have in my last wow, class yes, that I worked at. That would at. be awesome. And then that was that was an anonymous one. You only knew like, you know, what team they worked on, the broader team, so that you could uh, pinpoint right, what the te yeah. which team was. But that's a, uh, I just, that's, that, a cool that's idea. something that peaked in my mind when you were yeah. saying yeah. that, Suzanne. So thanks that's, for sharing. That's awesome. Because if you wait until an exit survey, they're already leaving. They've got one foot yes, in the door. Yes, they've kind of lost already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Martin now. You've got your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jordan. I think what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll let uh, Krista go first, okay. and then I'll, uh, I'll I'd like to hear what Krista has to say. Sure, Krista, go ahead. And I think, and Krista, I'm not sure if you've got your your audio issues. Um, yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. yes, we can. Great. Awesome. You're a little bit quiet, though. Are you able to maybe raise the volume a bit on that? Um, I won't be quiet. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. OK, that's that's better. <clears throat> so we are part, my f husband and I are part of the losing Dr. George Carruthers scenario. Um, and like Suzanne, I'm very frustrated. Um, we knew he was leaving and we're told that a nurse practitioner who was currently in his office was going to be staying there. Um, but things took a drastic change really quickly. Um, and my, uh, so I'll give you my own personal story. So I, I was sent by the nurse practitioner after Dr. Crothers left 
to a specialist. Um, when I went to Dr. Crothers' office um, after seeing the specialist to get some blood work and other things done, um, just a total schmazzle where there was a nurse called from the eye clinic at the hospital to take my blood work um, who didn't even recognize the blood work that was being asked for. Um, I, I realize and appreciate the fact that the specialist I saw did not have his own nurse to take blood. And I feel that that's also an issue because that's being put back on the general practitioner's family docs. Um, so that's extra manpower they have to have in place. Um, but after I had a, so I had a phone consultation then with um, the specialist after he did my blood work and everything. And um, he had some follow-up things that he wanted. He didn't need to follow up, but he wanted Dr. Crothers' office, per se, to follow up with. Um, he said to me to give them two weeks to um, get the letter back from him of what his recommendations were and um, to then start contacting them. I, like Suzanne, literally had called them until the phone disconnected. Um, I drove there one day on my lunch hour and was greeted by someone who said that the regular receptionist was out sick that day. I'm sure she had many sick days because I'm sure she was taking the brunt of what was yeah. going on there. And she had been with Dr. Crothers for a good many years. Um, was told that I'd hear back from them the next day. I still have never heard back from them. Um, I started calling Health PEI and spoke to a lovely lady, Candace, who wanted to help me, and I'm sure she did, but like everyone else that's on the front line, you can only do so much. Yeah. Um, she promised me that she'd get someone to call me, and I never heard anybody from anyone, so I called again. Finally spoke to a doctor. I can't even remember what his name was now, but... Um, he promised me that he'd phone me the following Monday. Um, my husband went to Dr. Crothers' office to make an appointment for himself, and he said he could tell that they were packing up the files and stuff, and they told him at that point that they weren't booking any appointments past June 11th. Um, I had actually spoken to Peter, Bevan Baker, several times about this, and very frustrated because who's going to do my follow-up care? Right. Um, you know, I, I was I, I don't mind sharing with you as I was being tested for lupus. It's not like I had an ingrown toenail like I have creatinine level issues and um, I just find it very frustrating. So yeah. I also went to a walk in clinic that was listed on the website that was going to be open from 10 till 12. I got I thought I was being proactive and got there at 920. The clinic was already full. Oh, yeah. It actually had started at eight th or nine o'clock in the morning. Um, so I ended up going in tears. I ended up going to the QEH and spent eight hours there. I, again, like Suzanne, do not fault the people at the QEH. They have yeah. literally saved both my children's lives. Yeah. Um, they are just still trying to be helpful to people, but it is just so messed oh, up. Mess. So messed up. Yeah. We finally got our letter in the mail saying that Dr. Crothers is gone, which we already knew. Uh, the nurse practitioner is now gone um, and pretty much just gave us the ultimatum that we have no, we have no continual care from anyone. Why? So that's my story. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Krista. Um, we are, I mean, you aren't alone, obviously there was over 3000 people on his patient list and, and, um, everything that I've heard from his patients, Dr. Crothers was, uh, an incredibly attentive family physician that looked after people for decades. And I'm sure that this must be awful for him, ex you know, like the way that this has all ended and, um, we've, when, when, uh, Dr. Garnham was at the standing committee, we talked to the sheer lack of respect for people when you can't even so much as communicate. Um, 
And that's just a starting point, like being transparent and letting people know that there's an issue and what the steps they're taking in order to try to rectify the situation. That's not a solution, but at least you're not left in the dark. And, you know, going through how you were obviously treated and um, there was 18 I, I months noticed. I, I'm actually going to say also, Michelle, that um, I, Dr. Crothers was a wonderful doctor, very attentive. Um, I actually had some pretty good heart to hearts with Dr. Crothers. I think doctors, like any other human, feel there's certain people they can actually say things to that are going to make sense. Yeah. And I know that I'm, I'm probably speaking at a turn because I'm, I'm saying what I think his thoughts were and maybe they weren't at all, but I really think that he was feeling very burnt out. Um, he's literally going to be 55 in August. He's exactly two months older than I am. Wow. And we, we kind of had a joke back and forth about that, that he was older than I was by two months. But um, a man that is 55 years old should not be he burnt so out, frustrated and burnt out that he no. needs to walk away. And I really, truly feel that he, he just, he needed to change, but I really just feel that he wasn't feeling supportive. I just wrote that down before you said it, Krista, because I, I, yeah, I would agree. That's exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for sharing all that, Krista. Details, but I know one time I had a test done um, that he called me back to retest and he said that um, he was not going to not do the second test, even though health PEI, and this is exactly what he said to me, that health PEI um, would not, th there's a window of six months that he's supposed to recheck this certain test. But he said, I will not do that because it's just not fair to people. So I think he went against some things that um, he just didn't believe in. And as a doctor, when you take an oath to save people's lives and help them, um, I think he battled with that a lot. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll see, Martin, are you, uh, would you still like to uh, speak? Yes, um, I asked, I, I, I don't know if I should be here or not, uh, Michelle, but I'm, I'm here oh, now. Okay. More than welcome. <laughs> and um, so uh, just to, for, the, for the benefit of those folks who um, are on the line here, uh, I arrived on the island four years ago and um, uh, have a government background uh, uh, audit and have reviewed healthcare systems in in Canada and other countries. So I, I've got that background. Um, when I so when I got here, I realized that I didn't realize that we had such a, such a poor healthcare system in a province of Canada. I couldn't believe it. So uh, I started on a quest to try to find out a little bit more like why is it why is it the case and um, I found I've, I've went to what I call root cause analysis so um, so I wrote jump forward four years I wrote some articles in the Guardian one of them was on healthcare and I identified what I believe to be some of the key missing links in terms of our healthcare system that's resulting in the symptoms that you folks are talking about. Uh, same ones that we're, we're, I'm dealing with as well. And I could list a number of encounters I had with the healthcare system similar to yours. And, and, um, and after I wrote the article in The Guardian, I got a number of emails and phone calls from folks telling me their stories and how bad things are. And that was just before Dr. Gardam came on the scene. And Dr. Gardam, uh, who's now the acting CEO of Health. PEI, but only health PEI is not, there's a, a bigger responsibility with respect to healthcare and PEI. There's the health PEI, but there's also the department that is also has a tremendous role in the delivery of healthcare, uh, which at this point in time, there's no clear understanding of what those roles and responsibilities are between the department and health PEI. So that in itself is a huge uh, 
underlying reason for why we are in the soup that we are in right now. However, having said all that, uh, Michelle, in all due respect, I'm going to be very naughty here. Uh, you're taking information about people's issues with dealing with the healthcare system here. And I believe that we all have, it, it's, it's, you talk to anybody on the island and they'll tell you the same stories. You don't need to, I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're all over the place. And uh, these poor, these two people that I just heard, I just heard you, uh, Krista and you, uh, Suzanne, uh, tell your stories. Uh, there, there's worse out there. There's much worse even people who have come close to dying because of the poor health care uh, system that we have here. So you're not going to solve these symptoms on this phone call. That's These are the symptoms of a broken health care system. Um, we need to get people to talk about, not about how to fix a replacement of a doctor here or a doctor there. We need to get a much bigger uh, fish, in, if you wish, in terms of the poor quality of our healthcare system. And, and I spoke to, doc, I, spoke, I went and did a presentation to the board of directors of Health PEI. And I basically, and, and I sent that to you, Michelle, uh, so you know, yeah. you, you know, and basically it, it's, I, I said that there's no way at this point in time that they can operate a, an effective healthcare system here in PEI. When I, call, when I say healthcare system, I'm talking about the whole spectrum of health from preventative, primary, acute, and post-acute care. I'm talking about the whole spectrum of, of healthcare in PEI. They, they, there's no way that they can deliver anything at this point in time because it's just totally, uh, it's, it's just totally broken. And I, I've given them some ideas on how to fix it, but one of the things that you can do, Michelle, and I asked the previous, your previous, uh, and, you know, your, 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 the previous uh, member of the Green Party who was in your position, that legislation has to be fixed. If you don't fix the start with le legislation, which sets out your framework for how healthcare should be delivered in, in PEI, it, you, you're, just, you're just going to continue to frustrate everybody in this province every time they have to encounter the healthcare system. And it's just not fair. It's not fair to these ladies. It's not fair to all the people that called me. And I, I spent hours on the phone with them, uh, Michelle. And, that, though, and, though, and that's just hearing again, because I wanted proof that when I said, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's having these issues, everybody is having these issues. This, there's not, there's hardly anybody out there who I can, who, who is not in this boat with us. So Michelle, you need to address the issues that will create the environment for these problems to be fixed, not fix, you can't fix the doctor problem yeah. in that, that right. uh, Dr. Carruthers problem. You can't fix the, the lack of follow-up issue, you know, follow-up care, these, the post-acute care that we, we, that everybody needs, but they can't get here. Uh, and that's creating um, health outcomes that are totally unacceptable. Yeah. Totally unacceptable. I mean, you, I, 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 you know, you just go to the website where they have to report uh, their health outcomes, you know, their service, their standard, the, uh, the wait times and all of that. And you'll see PEI is at the bottom of the list. We are the worst in Canada. And it's just in so many categories, it, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's not, it's just not fair to the people living in this province. So I, I go back, I, 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 you need to, I believe we need to speak up in a way that the folks that are here on this call and others in the province will understand that you really understand what the issues are with the healthcare system. Talk to talk about a doctor not, you know, being replaced or that that's just that's the problems that the healthcare folks need to fix. Not you. You need to I believe you as a legislator need to fix the structural issues that will create the type of healthcare system that we can all enjoy. And my only suggestion to you, and my, this was my idea, help P, because of my experience with small jurisdictions around the world, 
and I've done three now, I've done three and I've looked at many others, is that you can't operate such a small healthcare system as we have in PEI without having a, fun a structural linkage to other jurisdictions that will allow you to have the, the wherewithal to be able to provide the services in a way that we can in an affordable way. We're spending way too much money on services that are should be provided at a very low cost. We can't provide them because they're they're um, we're too small. So we're we're spending a lot of money and a lot of administrative overhead to try to provide those services without doing that. And my idea was, and this is the one only idea I've got for you, is that we need to look at the healthcare uh, in a much more global way in the Maritimes and deliver healthcare strategically as maritime region, as opposed to one province. Uh, because, on, because my friend in, uh, who's doing some work in Nova Scotia is seeing the exact same thing. They're, they're even too small. And that's a big, much bigger province than us. And, and his assessment of their healthcare system was again, that that's, it's just not scalable to be able to provide the kind of healthcare with the kind of support that we get from uh, the uh, from the federal government through the health transfer. The health transfer is how we pay for our our healthcare system here, mm -hmm. and we we they, they they can't jig it up enough. And this you know they asked if there was enough money. There isn't enough money to do it in in PEI with the number of people we have here. So you can keep trying. We, it all comes down to we cannot afford to put a healthcare system in place that would be, you know, that would meet the uh, standards of the rest of Canada with the amount of money that we're getting. We can't do it. And we don't, and especially with the people that we have right now who are leading our healthcare administration at the department level and at the, um, uh, certainly, at, well, healthcare, health PI just got a big bump up with Dr. Gardam, but, uh, before that, it was a it was a disaster, and the board who spoke to you at the at your hearing don't know what their role is. They their role is to mat to oversee and manage health PEI, and uh, I've got to say, Derek Keys failed to failed to understand his role when he was speaking to you, and I was hoping that you would take him to task and say, in the legislation it says that this is your your role. Don't you realize that? That is your role. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I it's. Um, I just wanted to say. I think if 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 you could make a difference, Michelle, it would be getting those fundamental structural issues fixed, so that we don't have to be dealing with all this other stuff that's coming along. Yeah. And, and I will say. Um, Martin, on that meeting with the board, for sure, I, I mean, very new, and there will be opportunity to bring the board back in, right? And that as we learn more, um, we have to remember that the standing committee can, can compel anybody to come in at any period in time. So as we learn more of what, you know, what the issues are, there is an accountability framework that is supposed to be coming imminently. Um, and my understanding is it's nothing more than a generic document. So once that is actually published, then um, I think at that point in time, it's we have to call them all to the standing committee at the same time. Um, because it's easy to point fingers and say this and that when they're there by themselves. But when, when everybody's there in the same room, um, the story changes, right? And right now, what I, what I'm what I'm hearing is no one has authority and um, no one's taking, um, nobody's taking accountability mm -hmm. or holding anybody else to account. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes. And obviously I need to ramp up Martin very quickly on that. Um, it is, um, the legislation is something that Michelle and I have been going through and, and um, like obviously I, uh, it's, that is a water hose for me, right? And, uh, but uh, something I recognize that has to be, and we have had the three levels of governance in, we have the department coming back in, we've met with them separately. So piecing together 
the stories that are being told to us. And I'm recognizing that there is a lot of circular conversations happening that are going nowhere. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Can I just make one more point? And that is to dealing with your committee and with your role as a the health critic. And that is that your committee also has significantly larger responsibilities and, and, and that will take its focus away from healthcare, uh, which is a huge issue in itself. There's, you, there's many other aspects to you, you, your, your, your committee work. And I believe that another suggestion that I would make is through your legislative, um, I think it's called the, legis um, the, work, the, the committee that looks at legislative work that's done and how it should be organized. Um, I forget which name, what's the name of that committee. Rules, privileges and <laughs> no, it's, I think it's, an, or it might be that one, or it might be the, anyway. LMC, where, maybe. I, I was talking to Peter about it at one point. Uh, the, I think what you, it's one third of the budget. Everybody is dealing with healthcare-ish all the time. And because of the crisis we're in right now, I believe your, your committee should deal completely and just totally on healthcare. And, and try to fit, to spend other time on other issues with adoption and all the other things that, you know, like I saw some other, you know, topics that you guys are, are dealing with that are part of your mandate as a committee. I just think it's, you're, you're trying to spread too thin. And I really think it, this okay. needs legislative oversight completely focused on healthcare. And I, and I just think we need to fix healthcare at this point. It's so important. One third of the, our, our provincial budget one third of our provincial budget is on this, and it's, it affects everybody's lives. So I, I just think we need we need we need to we need to re 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 jig how we address this issue uh, and uh, get it back. And then maybe someday when it's all working well, then you can bring back other things to your committee, whatever. But those those other things need to be shoved off to another committee. Anyway, that's my suggestion. Yeah, and I'll just quickly respond to that because you've just made me think. You know, when we when we had the special committee on poverty, we had the special special committee on climate action. So, legitimately, we could put forward a motion to um, strike a special committee on um, the healthcare system of Prince Edward Island. Thank you for that, Martin. I think that that would actually um, I, I'll bring that back and propose it because I think you're right. You know, there's so many things that for us to pick five priorities. Um, and have the healthcare system as it is today, but also knowing that Indigenous relations is within that committee, social development, housing, yeah. um, justice yeah. and public safety. There's just oh. so much. Right. That's an excellent um, suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So uh, we're, we're just a minute to, to, to eight. I know that Suzanne wanted to say something else and, I, and Krista's got her hand up again. Um, so I just want to check a couple things. First of all, is there anybody who hasn't spoken that uh, that wanted to get something something in uh, to Michelle? And Michelle, do you have a hard stop <laughs> right now, no, eight, or can we go another ten minutes? I'm good to go. Yeah. Okay, that's the thank you. That's very generous of you. So uh, so yeah, if there's anybody else that's just really wants to get something in before we uh, before we go, uh, raise your hand or you know say something in the chat and. Otherwise, uh, let's go. Let's go to Suzanne first, because uh, you had indicated you wanted to speak first, and then over to you, Thanks. Krista. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I, I just want to say basically what Martin presented and has put together, and and the the summary of doing the consideration of a special committee on healthcare, all all fits in one piece. And and I was just going to discuss something about uh, COVID, but but the. That is a priority. The other, the other is not necessary right now. Maybe another time. I surrender my time. Wow. Okay, you've just been blown away by. Let's get to the root cause. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he's right, yeah. and 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 I think um, Michelle's idea to to do this special committee and focus on it, you know, because the portfolio is so huge. I think this is a, 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 a very important idea. Yeah, see, that's what these discussions are all about. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so over to you then, uh, Krista. 
I just wanted to say that I totally agree with what Martin is saying as well. Um, I think a lot of other issues will get solved and sorted out, some of them on their own, if health people's health care is being looked after. Um, I work in an elementary school and I see a lot of stuff. And I just think that if people's health care is made a priority, um, a lot of other things will fall into place um, on their own. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Uh, we were talking about that with, with Carla, who's the social development and, uh, and housing critic now, you know, there's just, there's, you can't really separate health from social development. You know, you're talking about mental yeah. health and addictions and yes, huge. all those kinds of things, right? Yes, but okay. I, I mean all that stuff too, Jordan. You yeah. know, like I think if people's, if there was more attention being put on people's health in every aspect, um, a lot of other problems would get solved because people are, I, I just feel people are so stressed yeah, um, because of the situation yeah. and not getting answers that it's just making a lot of other things in their lives not good either. Including the doctors and nurses who have to deal with all of this as well. And they're trying yeah. to do a good job and, and instead they're involved in this social turmoil. It's terrible. Yeah. Hmm. And, and I would be more than happy to share my thoughts any time. As I would too, to the, the committee. <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah well and thanks thanks so much for making the time to come and share your thoughts uh here today um as i mentioned i just put this back in the chat here there's the link to the idea board i've been taking down notes from what people have been saying like takeaways for for michelle uh but feel free to add to this board and what I'll be doing is, uh, you know, tomorrow at the same time, I, I, I'll send out the recording to everybody who's registered and I'll also share the link again. And, you know, if I'll, I'll give you, you know, a few days, even like until Monday, say if you, something comes in your mind and you want to add another point to the board, uh, you can do that. And then Michelle will get everything that's on the board. So even if, you weren't able to get it in today, it's not too late. And I'll also share Michelle's email address, of course, uh, so you can reach out to her that way as well. And I will, I will say I'm a slow emailer, but <laughs> um, I, when the difference between the, the, um, the portfolios I have before and this one is I get a, I get way more email. So um, you mm -hmm. can also call me like call me anytime and that um and if you call the office i i return those calls and and uh that is an excellent way for us to communicate as well and i will share anybody that's on on the call like i understand that it is difficult to share your personal health story and a lot of it is private information and personal information and so if you feel like there's anything if, that you know you couldn't share in a group um, atmosphere today and you want to reach out to me to talk to me personally, please do. I'm more than happy to um, listen and, and uh, see how we can help you in the office. Okay, great. So that's what I'll do is I'll share, I'll share the phone number uh, yeah. where you can get a hold of Michelle or, or get her to give, give you a call back. And uh, so you'll all have that in your, your email inboxes tomorrow sometime. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, yeah, thank you. I'll again. Just, can I just yep. close by saying thank yeah, you, absolutely. everybody, for your honesty and for taking the time this evening and everything that you've shared tonight um, will really help me um, with focus. And, and uh, Martin, I know how um, involved in this you are and how passionate you are about it. And definitely once I get my feet underneath me, I would really like to kind of go through the legislation and um, really take a hard look at it because um, I haven't pulled that apart yet. And so if you would be open, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Michelle. Thank you everybody for coming. And uh, remember that we have one more uh, session of Meet the New Critics. It's gonna be with Trish Altas who was actually Michelle's predecessor in health and wellness. 
Uh, she is now the critic for Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, which may seem a little bit disparate, but actually they're very connected, especially these days, because we know that tourism and culture are have, have the worst economic growth, <laughs> probably <laughs> due to COVID. They've, they've been going through degrowth for a couple of years. And, uh, and those are very, very important sectors of, of our economy and, and just of our life here on PEI. So that's going to be a great conversation. Um, so I hope you can join us. I'll also send out the link to that in the, in the email that I send to you all tomorrow, just to remind you and so you can register. So uh, thanks very much and, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.